you can't rely on other people to do things for you. You kind of have to forge your own path. I'm petrified of a lot of things. I suffer really badly with anxiety. I've been seeing a therapist through my work, which is fantastic. It's a great thing to have. It just helps you explore all of those things that you want to kind of get out. I have a brother, Oscar, who is 15, has Down syndrome. For me, I wanted to kind of create this space where Oscar could do whatever he wanted to do. And I wanted to prove that there were businesses who would give him the opportunity. So I reached out to the Down Syndrome Association and said, I've got this really weird idea that I want to try. A lot of businesses treat diversity and inclusion like a tick box exercise. I don't want to sit in an interview and come out of it thinking, God, I really stuffed that up. And then they're ringing off me the job and I'm really excited. And then you walk in and you think, oh, everyone's male. I'm the only female here. I don't want to be in a job because I'm a woman. I know there are so many businesses that have these conversations, but then it's that next step of what we're going to do next. Welcome to The Virtuous Mindset. Thank you so much for having me. No, I'm really glad to have you. I was just thinking about the conversation we had a couple of weeks ago on yeah. Teams and we had some really interesting conversations <laughs> yeah. and I have no doubt that's going to come out today. But before we get started, as a Senior Talent Acquisition Manager, what does it mean to you to have a virtuous mindset? Um, I think for me, it's just about really kind of being quite honest with the things that you do. So the people that you talk to, the feedback that you give is genuine, it's constructive. Um, it gives people a space. So I think a lot of recruitment of been an you know a talent acquisition manager now for uh, well quite a while can't really think now I don't want to give away my age um, but I also <laughs> did recruitment as a consultant for quite a while and I think there's a big difference between the two um, for me personally being in that environment so I think for me now in this position it's definitely about making sure you make space for people creating routes into market for people that maybe don't have the same opportunities as other people so it's kind of just making space I guess. Yeah, I think honesty is a big thing. Yeah, I, I definitely can relate to that for sure. And your career is really interesting. I mean, we've spoken about it in great detail, but <laughs> yeah, you started off over. in yeah, exactly. You started off in recruitment, very similar to me, and then you ended up in talent acquisition. Mm -hmm. Talk us through that journey in terms of where you started and where you are, I suppose, today in talent acquisition. Well, I started in retail management. It's kind of where okay, I started, yeah, yeah. Um, and then went to an agency to try and find a job through retail um, and they kind of offered me a job in the agency and that was working with CV UK in the Leeds branch, which was fantastic. That was a real kind of grounding space because I was kind of got in there as a researcher and just had to, you know, dig and find candidates for all of the different roles that we had for the northeast uh, and the northwest of England. Um, and that was really interesting because I picked up some really good clients in there. Mm. I worked really closely with New Look at the time and did a lot of their work. Um, so, yeah, just kind of that was a really good place to kind of not be worried about putting in the graft because mm. I think as a recruiter at that level you need to be able to work really hard um, and kind of scour every place that you can find for different CVs and different candidates and just be talking to so many different people because the ratios you know you've got to speak to 10 to get yeah, they one matter. or two good oh, ones yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah that was a real good grounding and then I went to Quantica which was again another massive space because that was international um, and that was my first exposure to that so took kind of the working with New Look and expanded that so started working with them in Paris through MIM um, I took All Saints so I did all of their store openings in Europe so that was really interesting for me and it was kind of that retail space that I recruited in because that's what I knew mm. from my own background um, and that was that was good because that was that was challenging because I was kind of trailing the streets in Paris and Berlin and you know headhunting people on foot as well as everything wow. else so you kind of had to learn to have a thick skin yeah. which in recruitment pays off um, so yeah that it was a real great experience worked with some fantastic clients at Quantica and it was a really great space and I wanted to move to London mm. so moved down there and opened a retail desk for them there which was brilliant and I think I stayed for about a year and a half before I decided to try something totally different and went into fashion trade shows and I did that for about four or five seasons met loads of different brands kind of always stayed in that retail fashion space um, and then relocated back to a different part of London, so into the kind of uh, into um, Stoke Newington, mm -hmm. and started working at um, Sports Direct, yeah. um, which was a bit of a random one for me, but it was it was good. It was a really great kind of business. It has a lot of different um, reputations, I guess, yeah. <laughs> for different things. But for me, it was one of the best experiences I've ever had. So you know it was hard and you had to work really hard and there was a lot of different characters there so there was a lot of challenges that came out but my role was really anything apart from sports direct so mm. i did all of the brands that they 
owned. Um, and Mike Ashley made a real habit of buying some really good brands. So that was fantastic. So you worked with Flannels, USC, Republic. So it was kind of bringing on lots of, lots of different businesses. And I think that's where the honesty part really paid off mm. because you were working with businesses who people had a real vested interest in. Mm. And we always bought kind of part of that business rather than the whole business. So there was still people interested and vested in what you were doing. Mm -hmm. So you had to be really kind of upfront and clear about, well, this is what we need and this is how we're going to get there, but let's do it together and kind of find the space. So that was probably a real eye opener for me, I think, and gave me a lot of, um, yeah, a lot of exposure and a lot of experience. And I think it was kind of being able to do everything. I you know, reinvented their websites for their careers pages because they just hadn't done that since probably two or three years before I was there. Um, and just get yeah, just got real exposure to doing lots of different things, doing a lot of chupies when we were bringing people over. And then I got my first exposure of gyms because we did the Sports Direct yeah. Fitness. Um, and that was that was brilliant. And I then kind of had children and relocated up to Scotland. And I was like, well, what do I want to do? I don't want to stay in this job forever because I'd been on maternity, come mm. back as a recruitment partner. Mm. I was kind of like, I don't know what I want to do. And there was nowhere else for me to go unless I moved to London. And having a child was probably not the right time to move back to London because it was still pretty mm. expensive. Um, so they were, you know, it kind of put me in that position where I had to make a choice about what I wanted to do so I'd worked with a brilliant woman called Barbara Kidd who works for or owns a company called Planny um, Recruitment and she approached me about going to work for her and that was brilliant because I could work from home so mm -hmm. I lived in a tiny little village in Scotland <laughs> where there was never going to be any opportunities but yeah. managed to do again some international recruitment working for some brilliant brands again mm -hmm. and that kind of got me back into the recruitment side and whilst I loved working with Barbara and it was a fantastic business because it was you were really quite autonomous with what you were doing um, I, I kind of quickly realised that actually being on that side of it wasn't where my passion lay. Mm -hmm. What I enjoyed about the sports direct element of it is that you could see the, you know, the candidates that you were bringing in and placing mm. come to kind of fruition and, mm. oh, sorry, um, and get really great exposure and really great experience and you'd see them get promoted through the business. Mm. So you knew you were hiring the right people mm. and you could see their lives changing because of the things that, you know, the roles and the opportunities that yeah. they were getting. And that for me was probably the bit I was passionate about was mm -hmm. the people. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes that can get lost when you're a recruitment consultant because mm -hmm. you kind of, you do the attraction and the, there you go, you get your, you get your win and then you move on to the next one. Mm. So being in a business and being a talent acquisition manager allowed me to kind of see that part and be a part of what the growth of the journey was for the business as well as the people we were bringing in. And you were able to shape that with the types of people that you brought into the business. So, um, yeah, quite quickly realised the agency side probably wasn't my bag. The, you know, the picking up the phone and having to sell to businesses about, you know, oh, we've got great candidates, why don't you let me work for you? It just wasn't my thing. And now I, I'm on the other side of that. Yeah. Having agencies ringing me all the time with things. So yeah. working in the talent acquisition space allows me to kind of create and be a part of that culture and, you know, frame what it is that we want to do with the business. So obviously ended up back at the back in talent acquisition working with the gym group and, yeah, I've been here now nearly four years, so yeah, yeah it's wow. been, been fantastic. Kind of moved through different roles and, and we've been through a lot, obviously, COVID yeah. um, and a lot of different changes. So, yeah, we've it's a it's a really great space and I think the culture of that business is fantastic and it's it's a bit of me, so I'm, I'm enjoying it. It's really yeah. good. Yeah, I think the long-term relationships that you develop are really, mm. really important. And like you said, that sometimes when you're a 360 consultant, it's very easy to do that piece of recruitment and then move on to the next. So the fact that you get to achieve that through talent acquisition is is really interesting. But I want to talk about the gym group because you mentioned that before. Now, everybody has heard of the gym group, especially if you're living in the UK. You're living under a rock if you haven't heard of I the gym group. I hope so, because <laughs> yeah, we used to get a lot of it. We used to, when you tell people you work for the gym group, the gym group they go, the gym group, is that pure gym? And you're like, no, no, it's no, not, no, it's no, the no. gym group. It's the gym group. Uh, and so trying to get people to understand it, but we've done a lot of rebranding and repositioning and, uh, and in the market. And I think it's really done us the world of good. So hopefully now, yeah, people yeah. know who we are and they see us and they recognize the Super G. And Yeah, well, yeah. I'm slightly biased because I've always gone for the gym group ever since graduating from uni. It's so affordable and yeah. it really makes a difference. But for those that don't know, can you give us a brief overview of where the gym group is today and also what makes it different from its competitors? Yeah, of course. So we've got around 233, 34 gyms um, across the UK. So um, majority of them are probably in the London area because mm. obviously it's a, a big space, yeah. but we go all the way up to kind of, you know, Perth and up into um, into Scotland and right down to kind of Plymouth and, and, you know, those kind of places. So we, yeah. we're, we're all over. Um, 
we've got some really great people who work for us and I think what makes us different is our culture and mm. our people mm. because we are really people say it all the time and I think it probably can be quite cheesy sometimes about you know it is our people that make us but it really is mm. because actually our people contribute a huge amount to what we do they're our face the people mm. in our gyms are our you know who you see as a member and yeah. who other people see and so it's really important that we have the right people and they're passionate about what we do and the journey that the business is on um so yeah we're, we're kind of expanding into lots of different areas within it so obviously we were always bricks and mortar gyms um you know 24 7 most affordable gym in the uk which was great we're now kind of the friendliest gym in the uk yeah. which is fantastic and if you kind of go um, check on Glassdoor, all of our ratings are kind of the top above all of our competitors for all of the different things and we pride ourselves on the friendliest piece because actually that's what we're about it's our people it's our culture it's who we are you know encouraging people to take that next step because the gym can be quite an intimidating space mm. um and so it's our kind of role is to break down that barrier for fitness so that people from every background, from every location can kind of come in and, and try their hand at it. And we've got the right people in the right places to help them on that journey, which is really great for us. So that's kind of what sets us apart, I think. And that's why I love it so much because the culture is just such a brilliant space. Yeah, and I feel like you always are welcomed when you come to Massively, the gym group yeah. and people are willing to help you. And yeah. especially if you've not, you're not really a gym goer, especially like if you're not necessarily going every day, yeah. then it can really be quite daunting, like you say. Yeah, especially. and they, you know, and that's it. And they've got great classes, which kind of give you that space to kind of try try things out and get involved. And the memberships are great. And you can kind yeah. of get all of the different classes. Ones and, yeah, the classes changer. are really good. Yeah, they are really good. So yeah, yeah I think we, we offer a real kind of, great offering it's affordable as you said so i think it's just it's a great space to be in the current climate in a financial crisis it's kind of a difficult space because yeah. usually it's one of the first things to go when people are tightening their belt but yeah. for us we've seen a real influx of members mm -hmm. because of the good reputation that we're having and the rebranding's really helped because people know who we are and you see us on the high street and i think yeah it's it's just such a great business to be a part of because the the goals have been the same since i joined mm -hmm. and we've navigated some kind of difficult spaces obviously covid when we had to shut all of the gyms down and you know we weren't allowed to reopen and then we kind of had to open them really slowly with yeah. all of the ppe and all of the other mm. bits that made it a little bit difficult and a yeah. bit, little bit daunting for people to kind of come back into that space mm -hmm. um but we're back there membership is back you know it's it's great we're doing really well we're really it's a, just a really positive environment to be in now and i think yeah. hopefully we're welcoming more and more people back in and yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. I want to dig into the some of the stuff that you've been doing behind mm -hmm. the scenes because we've talked about the initiatives that you've got involved yeah. in and that was one of the reasons why I got in touch with you because I can see that you're really taking action and that you're doing something about it. But for those that don't know, let's talk about the Kickstart Fitness Trainee Scheme which is aimed at 16 to 24 year olds facing long-term unemployment. Can you explain to us what the scheme is in your own words, I yeah. suppose? Yeah, so it was a government uh, funded scheme and they kind of launched it to help promote and get young people who are facing that kind of long-term unemployment mm. to get them back into work and create opportunities for them. So what they set out was for businesses to kind of come in and offer spaces to people that the government would fund, so they would pay for them, um, and you would just put them in and give them work experience, basically. And the aim wow. was to kind of bring them in and give them that, make them kind of employment ready by the end of the programme. Um, so, you know, helping them with CVs and that kind of responsibility of, making sure you're on time and, you know, having being accountable for the things that you do. Um, and that was kind of the aim of the scheme was to mm -hmm. hopefully make them more employable by the end of that program than they were when they joined. Yeah. For us, we kind of took it a step further and, uh, you know, mm -hmm. I like yeah. to try and, we like to try and lead, I think is probably what yeah. I would say. And uh, it's definitely something that I like. I'm quite creative and it's brilliant being a part of a business that allows you that space to push things and push boundaries. And it's one of our values is to kind of challenge your limits. And that's, definitely what we wanted to do with this so I was kind of doing it off the side of my desk managing um you know the recruitment because at that point after it was just after covid mm. I'd kind of lost my team during that period of time mm. so it was just me and I was like right we need to do something else let's be part of this it seems like a no-brainer why wouldn't we do it and I was like but actually I don't want to just give them work experience because that works for them and that's fantastic mm. but for us selfishly we really want to get people into fitness mm. and coming out of COVID there wasn't enough people moving into fitness so people who were fitness trainers or personal trainers had kind of moved out of the industry because mm. they'd got jobs doing things that were a bit more stable for them and they could do during COVID so there was just a real small pool now left of people that we could bring into those roles so I was kind of like we need to do something that's going to have a bit more longevity and actually offer them a career and not just you know a, a six month experience. program yeah. um so 
we decided that we would partner up with a training provider and actually train them so that when they left, we could employ them. Mm -hmm. So to work in our gyms as a fitness trainer, you have to have your level two and your level three in personal training. Mm -hmm. So for us, people, if they don't have those qualifications, we can't hire them. It's just that's what it is to be a personal trainer. You have to be qualified. You have to be insured. You have to have all of those things. So it was so important for us to kind of find a way to put more people back into that pool. So, yeah, we offered them their level two and their level three. So we set out on that kind of six month program and the first 12 weeks was purely getting them qualified. So we paid for their qualification. So the government gave you a, a, a grant for every person that you brought on. And a lot of businesses used that, you know, as it was intended to kind of build the program and, and create a space and, and give those people the best experience that they could give. We used it and put it back into the candidates to actually qualify them so wow. that when they left us, they could actually be a self-employed personal trainer. They could go and do boot camps and parks or they could come and work for us. Yeah. Um, which for us was a fantastic opportunity because it meant we were not only bringing people into the market, but we were training them and with the with the kind of viewpoint that we would offer them a job at the end of it. Mm. So it was their job to lose throughout the six month program. Mm. Um, so we did it in all of our we did it across most of our estate. Um, and I think we put something like 200, I think it was 230, 250 people through the program. Uh, I think 68 percent of the fitness trainers that we put through the program actually got employed by us in the end wow and we did it in head office as well so we did it in the marketing team and we did it in finance we did mm. it in different departments mm. um and i think about a third of them stayed with us in employment afterwards as well so it wasn't just about that kind of running the duration of the program yeah. for us it was a long-term yeah. plan yeah so yeah we had some really great people come out of the other side of it yeah. and they were people who probably wouldn't have been given the opportunity yeah. they would never have been able to work in a gym because yeah. they didn't have the qualifications mm. they didn't have the money to fund themselves because qualifications for fitness are quite expensive um, how much does it cost roughly it really depends where you go. The prices are changing quite a lot, mm. but at the time it was mm. probably two and a half, three grand to do it. Really? Yeah. Wow. For someone independently to do yeah. it for themselves. At the time it was it was quite expensive because it was at the peak still because yeah. people, they were trying to get people back into it. You can probably find it and people offer um, financing and things to mm. do it now. But for us, we invested that money. We've got a partner and we delivered it and we kind mm. of put all of those people through this mm. program. So yeah, it was a brilliant, brilliant program for us. Bringing people from all different demographics up and down the country into gyms that probably had never set foot in there before and maybe enjoyed a bit of PE at school and <laughs> weren't really sure what they were going to do. And we had people who were career changing as well, who mm. just had come out of jobs during the pandemic and not been able to find anything and couldn't get back into that role mm. and just fancied something different. And yeah, we had some really, really great people come yeah. out the other side of it. So for us, it was it was fantastic. Yeah, I really like the fact that there's a long term development that goes on within yeah. the business because you're right in the fact that you can offer work experience for a, for a period of time, but then what happens afterwards? What are they yeah. going to do next? So that's quite interesting that they that you said a third of them ended up staying and yeah. continuing on. What's the impact been like l looking back now? What's the impact been if you consider the third that have stayed off the basis of the program? That so there was a third started? in our in our head office that stayed it was 68 percent of them that stayed when it, it in the actual gym so for us it was fantastic because we were coming out of a pandemic where we had no fitness trainers to employ in the gyms which meant that members weren't able to get personal training or we weren't able to deliver classes and all of those kind of things so for us as a business mm. we've been able to kind of revamp the group x piece we've had some really skilled personal trainers come through the ranks and kind of work in the business we've hired them as fitness trainers in our gyms where they kind of work for us and then they also pt outside of that some of them have built such successful businesses. They've moved into standalone PT. So wow. we've had some really great stories come out of it. And we were able to really help people. There was a lot of people who had struggled with lots of different things. I think what mm -hmm. the eye-opener for us probably that I hadn't expected going into it was that there would be a real mental health element to it. Okay. Um, we had a lot of young people. And I think we yeah. were, we're now in a space where people are more open to talk about their mental health. Yeah. Um, and we had a lot of challenges coming through that where people just didn't quite know what to do. And there was a lot of kind of yeah. issues that people had, whether that was, you know, depression, mm. suicidal thoughts, different elements that I just hadn't actually planned to deal with when I recruited yeah, all of these yeah. young people. Of course. Um, but that was an experience and that actually then led us to do a lot more around mental health and we now have mental health ambassadors in our gyms, in, in our business and head office. So we've put in text lines, we've done lots. So we learned a lot from that experience as well, 
for the wider business not just for those young people so I think it was really yeah, yeah it was it was a real learning curve for us but I was kind of doing it off the side of my desk and after yeah. the first cohort uh, I was kind of like yeah I, I need help I can't do this by <laughs> myself this is because of the the, the intensity of what mm. you were doing with those young people there was a lot some mm. of them were coming from you know different backgrounds where there was just elements that were kind of drawing them away from the good path that they were mm. probably going to find so um, we brought someone in who's our early careers manager Karen and mm -hmm. she's fantastic and she just took it from strength to strength and mm. uh, we grew every time we got more and more people and yeah we put through I think roughly about 250 people through the program wow by the end that's of the, so impressive by the end you of the should program. be proud yeah that's we a big were we were really pleased with it at yeah. the time we were really pleased and it yeah. was it was a lot of hard work and a lot of yeah you know sweat and tears yeah and I can imagine on both sides yeah. <laughs> not only in the gyms but in our desks as well but yeah. it was it was a great a great thing to be a part of it was really yeah. and it was something I'd never done before so I was kind of right. like yeah I want to try it let's do it let's see how we yeah. get on and dream big and we kind of managed to deliver it which was yeah. brilliant so yeah, yeah. It, was, it was a really great thing and we got some really great feedback from the, the DWP as well and we partner with them now still in other areas so but yeah it's just a really positive experience for for everyone yeah well that leads me on to my next point actually because as you said you did this on the side effectively and <laughs> yeah. you you know you're you don't have the support initially and you're someone that really thinks outside the box you're not staying in your lane how did you gather the confidence to go and roll an initiative like that because it's it's difficult to be able to to do that if especially if you don't have the backing mm -hmm. in some cases people don't so you know how did that happen for you you say confidence, I probably say stupidity for <laughs> some, some parts of it. I think I kind of naively went into it thinking, this will be great, I'll just do this, it'll yeah. be brilliant, we'll just make it happen. Yeah. And I, I'm definitely a solution finder. I don't always, I'm not always in the detail. Probably my, my team would definitely tell you that. <laughs> um, so I kind of dream big and I'm just like, well, let's, if we aim up there and we land somewhere near it, we've done more than we thought we could in the first place. So let's just give it a go. And I think yeah. also working for a business where they're so supportive of the people mm. in it. They encourage you to, like, you know, as I said, our values are to kind of challenge your limits and take the first step. So they want us to try new things. They want us to push the boundaries. And we're in a really competitive market. So we're not going to be in a space where we just want to follow everyone else. We always want to try and, and mm. push that kind of... Boundary, yeah. Yeah, push the boundary and, and do new things and yeah. hopefully inspire the rest of the industry to do the same thing. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it was, it was good to be in a business that would allow me to do it. It's that kind of, you know, ask for mm. forgiveness, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I just thought, well, let's try it and see what happens. And when we kind of sold the idea of the kickstart and what it was going to do, you know, we did get some pushback from the gyms because mm. they were kind of like, well, we've had no part in this. We don't know who they are. Mm. You know, it's quite hard work. And mm. I was like, yeah, it is. But yeah. the reward at the end of it is not only that you're going to have some people working in your gym, but you'll have changed this person's life. And I think that's a really great space to be able to stand in, you know, mm. stand in that light and be like, yeah, I did that. Mm. And I think that was what kind of inspired people then to want to be a part of it. Um, mm. But yeah, being a part of a business that wants to do things and, yeah. you know, it is our, it was one of our founding um, kind of um, like agendas, if you like, was to, to break down barriers. Yeah. And that is something that they, we still try and do. So, yeah. you know, breaking down barriers to fitness for all was just about making it accessible for everyone. Right. That's kind of adapted as we've grown and it's now about the whole kind of diversity and inclusion and, and just making it a space that everyone can be a part of because yeah. we found through doing Kickstart that there was key kind of demographics where people just mm. couldn't afford to mm. spend the money that they needed to to be able to get the qualifications. And so being us being able to be a part of that and put that out there for people mm. meant that we could invite people in who would never have had that opportunity without it. Yeah. And so, yeah, it was a real positive for us. But, have, yeah, yeah, like I say, being a part of a business that pushes that is... Yeah and encourages it is good yeah what would you say to those that perhaps are not supported by their employer because the gym group is that is a business that is about challenging those mm. boundaries and like you said you've mentioned it to me today but what about those individuals that are perhaps in a similar position to yourself that want to lead an initiative they want to roll it out but they don't, they're not backed by their employer they don't know what to do in those situations what's your thoughts ask questions find people who have done things before or people that inspire you and ask questions because you know I'd never done it before I'd never run the kickstart scheme it didn't exist mm. before the government put it out there so mm. I'd never done anything like that before um I'd done it at Sports Direct where we kind of done internships and I had to figure that out as I went along and I kind of just took that learning and thought right well if I did that and I yeah. tried this and how else could we do it yeah. so just yeah just ask questions and be brave with it sometimes because you have to 
be willing to make mistakes. Mm. And when we say how successful it was, it really was, but that doesn't mean we did it without any challenges. It had its challenges and we had hiccups and we had issues that we had to overcome. Um, but I think as long as you've got a goal and you work towards it, then you'll always, you know, you'll always strive to be the best at what you do. And mm. for me, that's definitely what I want to do. I want to be in a room because I'm the best person for that job. And that's kind of what I, where I want to get to. And I think everyone, I kind of just drag people along on that yeah. journey. But yeah. um, I'm quite driven when I have um, things like that. My colleagues will probably tell you I'm a bit of a dog with a bone when I've got an <laughs> idea and I want to do something. I just think it's it's fun. And, and for me, it's exciting to do something that no one else has tried before mm. because even if you mess up, no one needs to know about it. You just yeah. carry on doing what you're doing. But for us, we were we got some really great successes out of it. So, yeah. but what I learned from was asking people, asking people yeah. advice, sounding ideas off people, and get you know what I've been learning is get the data, get the mm. data that backs up what you're doing, show what the problem is, mm -hmm. and show why you think that this would, you know, resolve that issue or impact it positively. There's lots of different charities, or there's lots of you know there's government funding for a lot of these things. Yeah. You know, they match place a lot of different schemes and programs that you can run when it comes to training and development and there's things like that that you can really get involved in yeah. and there's lots of different charities that will back a lot of these things and will help that you can partner with and create something great with yeah. them in yeah. a partnership just explore all of that just, yeah. just ask questions and explore it and don't be afraid to mess it up sometimes because if you don't try you'll never ever get anywhere yeah. so you've got to make mistakes and just build from them as long as you learn yeah then yeah it's always going to yeah. you'll get some positives out of it. It might not be the one you started out mm, with, mm. but you might come out with something even better. Mm. So you have to kind of try and just push yourself to to try, Yeah, I guess. I was going to say the alternative as well is that if you're working for a business that where your values are not aligned with the company values and they're not backing you despite you asking mm. those questions, then consider other opportunities. Yeah, I mean, that, that did thing. cross my mind. I didn't know how positive <laughs> that would be on a podcast. But yeah, I mean, if... Yeah. if if you're for sure if your values yeah. aren't aligned with what the business is doing you, find you another leave, employer yeah. you will because people will often say you know we're passionate about diversity and inclusion or we're pa passionate about encouraging people into an industry or into yeah. a role but actually you ha it's not always about putting your money where your mouth is but there there is an element of that you have to be brave mm. and you have to try new things because yeah. for me I get really frustrated when everyone you know everyone always does it naturally they compare you to the competition and of course yeah. that's what they do yeah um but I learned from a young age that you kind of have to be willing to compete you know I, mm. I competed in athletics when I was younger and so yeah. you were always I wasn't always going to win but as long as I turned up and I did my best then that was okay um, and I think that's kind of the same thing when you're in the workplace. But if your work don't back that and don't want the best for you, you know, then maybe you're in the wrong space yeah. because actually you want to, you know, you've earned your seat at the table when you get to a business and you want to feel like that's the level of respect that you get. Yeah, you're not going to be able to open every door that you knock on, but yeah. ask questions, Yeah, you know, kind of find a mentor, get advice do lots of different things and constantly develop yourself yeah. because by developing yourself and learning new things you can bring other people on that journey and, yeah. and help them yeah. and take them on that on that journey for themselves and help them discover what it is that they want because quite often you go into a business thinking mm -hmm. you're going to do something and then it turns out that actually that maybe isn't what you want anymore because mm -hmm. there's other things that interest you life happens yeah do you mean you you have kids you you know it's okay to change you your mind yeah exactly it's okay yeah. to change your mind try yeah. it see how you get on yeah. For me, I think it's it's very much if I if I don't try it, I don't think I could live with the what if part. So mm. I kind of just want to give it a go and, and see what happens. And yeah. sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And yeah, that's OK. Yeah, I like it. No, it's a good piece of advice. Yeah. Let's talk about your other scheme that you have introduced. This mm. is your inclusive traineeship scheme. Yeah. What's the story behind that? We've talked about it, yes. but for those that don't know. It is my probably my proudest achievement, I think, yeah. in any of the jobs that I've had. Um, so... A little bit of background to it is that sure. I have a brother. Well, I have two brothers. I better give them both a shout out. But one of them, uh, Oscar, who is 15, has Down syndrome. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a... And one of my really good friends has just had a child with Down syndrome and it wasn't expected. And I think people go through it almost like a... a like almost like a grieving process because actually mm -hmm. when you have a kid, you expect them to do all of the things that children do and they grow mm -hmm. up and they have all of these milestones and mm -hmm. they're going to grow up they're going to get their first job they're going to go to university or they're going to go to college and they're going to have their first apartment their boyfriends girlfriends get married do all of those great things and sometimes when a child is born with a disability mm -hmm. that changes because mm -hmm. actually it shouldn't and it's not right but sometimes your mindset can then play tricks on you like oh well what i thought was going to be their path or their journey 
mm. now might not be their journey and they're going to have all these obstacles that are going to come up and you kind of go into a panic mode and a defence mode for your child and, and all of those kind of elements hit home and it can be quite a difficult space for people. Um, and so our family was no different you know mm. he was born my dad had myself and my other brother from um, his first marriage and then he got married again and had my my little brother Oscar and so I think for me I wanted to kind of create this space where Oscar could do whatever he wanted to do mm. and I wanted to prove that there were businesses who would give him the opportunity mm. if he wanted it you know he loves being in fitness my brother he doesn't particularly do well but not eating pizzas he likes a lot of pizzas but he <laughs> loves he loves being in sport he likes to do mm. rock climbing he mm. likes to go to sports club on a saturday he plays football um so he is very active and so i thought well yeah why wouldn't somebody like oscar want to work in a gym and why couldn't they work in a gym i want to make that happen and i want to show that actually that can happen it never been done before because the qualifications piece mm. you have to have the level two the level mm. three um, and so for me, it was a personal project. Um, and I kind of flew it under the radar initially because <laughs> because it was, you know, it's it's money. You have to put money up front to pay for all of these things. And it wasn't something we had on the plan. And I mm. kind of was like, I stumbled across something. And I think I'd watched the movie Intern. I don't know if you've ever seen it. No, and, I haven't. No. Um, I think it's a Robert De Niro film. Oh, and wait, I have, older, with Anne Hathaway. Yes. And he's older <laughs> and he comes back to the workplace. And I was like, see, that? I love that idea. That's yeah. a great thing to do. Why wouldn't you do that? Why wouldn't you give people who want to have a career change an opportunity? Sure. And I, so it kind of that sparked a little bit of what I wanted to do. So I reached out to the Down Syndrome Association and said, I've got this really weird idea that I want to try. Uh, it's kind of got, well, I had a couple of ideas yeah. <laughs> uh, as I do. And I kind of just threw all the ideas at them and they were like, okay, yeah, we really want to be involved because mm -hmm. actually after the pandemic, a lot of people with Down Syndrome hadn't gone back to the gym or hadn't gone back to their love of fitness because of mm -hmm. the fear of being in a gym environment. Um, you know, was it clean? Was it safe? Was it healthy for them to be there? So a lot of people hadn't ventured back. Mm -hmm. So for them, the partnership was a great thing for them to kind of promote fitness and get people back mm. into the gym. And for us, I was getting that kind of space to be like, yeah, you can do this. If you want to do it, you can do it. So they partnered us with WorkFit, who are their partner for getting people with Down syndrome into work. And there are some brilliant businesses who already do it. So I wasn't by any stretch of the imagination the first to offer work to people with Down syndrome. Obviously, there are some really great businesses who do it. Um, but ours was a little bit different because, again, I wanted to give them a qualification. I didn't want to just give them the work experience and say mm. that you can come and work mm. in a gym, but technically you can't because you don't have the qualification. I wanted to give them that entry level experience. So they got the exposure. They got to be a personal trainer um, for 10 weeks. But they also got, came, got to walk away with a qualification that started them on that journey if they wanted to continue on it. So we put them through their level one um, in healthy lifestyle and activities or something along those mm -hmm. lines. I can't even remember the name of the qualification off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. But what that did was it gave them access to kind of ideas about nutrition um, and how to live a healthy, active lifestyle and what exercises were good for different things, parts mm -hmm. of the body, things like that, which actually for people with Down syndrome in, in the experience I've had with my brother and the other kind of peers that he had was sometimes a struggle because actually that awareness of their own bodies and what mm -hmm. was good for them is different for for everybody so it was kind of it was interesting so we put them through that qualification and we did a 10 week program where they did um some days in the gym with the gym team and like i say worked on the gym floor mm. spoke to members got involved in classes mm. did all of these great things and then um also did the qualification with the training provider vhf who were our partner um and they were really great as well because I was kind of like, I don't know how people will come into this because learning for everyone, as you know, when you go to school, people learn in different ways. It's no different for people with Down syndrome. Mm -hmm. So we needed to get into a space where we were like, this is a qualification, but one might pick it up differently than the other. And so we mm -hmm. needed some one-to-one -one tutorial time with them. The coaching from the gym teams needed to be really on point to make sure that it was broken down in a way that they would understand it and that they could take that and move with it. Um, so VHF were brilliant and they kind of looked at the qualifications, looked at what needed to be done and worked it in a way that meant that it was accessible. Mm. Um, so, yeah, we, we did it. We delivered the qualifications. We had five of them come in, uh, five different individuals come in and work with us for 10 weeks. And uh, three of them are coming back, which is great. So one of them, uh, Izzy, her dream job was to be a Zumba instructor. That's what she wanted to do. <laughs> so I was like, when, once they'd finished, it was really exciting. And we gave them their graduation certificates and we gave them hoodies and all that kind of stuff. So yeah. they were really excited. Yeah. But yeah, when when I kind of sat on it, I was like, I'm not content with just letting her walk away. When she wants to be, she wants to be in the industry and we are in the, in the industry. So why are we not doing something different? So I kind of said, look, I want to bring her back. 
I want to give her a level two. What do you think? And everyone was kind of like, yeah, okay, yeah. And I suppose I spoke to the training provider and said, look, can you do it? Can you get her through a level two mm -hmm. so that she can do classes and mm -hmm. teach exercise to music? Can you do that? And they were like, yeah, we can do that. Mm -hmm. So we asked her and she was beside herself. She was so excited. So yeah, she's coming back. She starts with us at the end of this month and wow. uh, is doing her level two exercise to music. So we'll be teaching exercise dance classes in our Bristol gyms once she's qualified. So yeah, we are really excited. And some of the other guys are coming back for further work experience with a view that they want to start looking at their level twos as well. So mm. yeah, it's a, it's a brilliant space. They were, you know, there were young people who would never have had the opportunity mm. to come into a gym before, never would have thought that they could. But again, you know, harp on about it but the breaking down the barriers piece was mm -hmm. clear for me also I, I work with the disability focus group with the gym group so we yeah. have a real great group where we're trying to find ways that we can make the gyms more accessible mm -hmm. not just physically but just what the offering is for people um so yeah we all kind of fell into part of that and yeah we launched it and definitely one of the proudest things i've i've ever done and it was just a great thing to yeah. show. When we showed the business what we were doing, mm. everyone was so excited about it because it's just not something that they had seen. And you've never, we, we'd never seen it in fitness. No one had ever really done it before. So, um, yeah, it was, it was really exciting. And, we, yeah, we, we changed the, the course of those people's lives, which was great. Yeah, I saw the article, actually. I remember oh, reaching you? out to you <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> based on that. So, no, it, I, can, I can really see that you care. And yeah. that's, that's really, really inspiring to see. But what I want to get to is where does that drive and that ambition to to bring change really come from? Like, are there any earlier experiences that you've had? I know you've spoken about your brother having Down syndrome. Is there anything that you can draw upon perhaps in your childhood, earlier memories that you've had that have really shaped the experiences you have today? Uh, I don't know. I think my my dad was kind of self-employed and worked really hard. My mum was really driven. Mm. You know, neither of my parents had been to university, so I was the first one to go to university in my yeah. family. Um, they'd kind of just made a life for themselves. And my mum had a really successful job, you know, working in, in the media Um and then we moved to Scotland and she was had a really good job there too. So I think seeing it yeah. um, makes it achievable, doesn't it? I think, yeah. And that's part of what we do. So even in our recruitment campaigns and things like that, we try and show the demographic of people that we're trying to reach out to because actually yeah. it's and it, that age, age old kind of saying is if you can see it, you can be it. And I think for me, being able to see people doing great things, it's like, well, why can't I? Yeah. And I'm kind of just made that way, I guess. I don't know. But yeah. especially yeah. now I've got a daughter so um, for me, it was about, yeah, I want to be able to create a space where they can do whatever it is they want to do. I want to give them that grounding that they can see if you try. It doesn't matter if you make a mistake or if you fail, you just pick yourself up and you go again. Yeah. And yeah, that kind yeah. of... I don't know where it came from. I just well, I kind think of seeing other people, have a space. especially when you mentioned your mum being really successful, I think that does help mm. because you're growing up with that, you're around someone like that, and that energy can really have a huge impact yeah. in, in the future. So. Yeah, and I think yeah, I'm like my you know my mum's mum and my dad's mum mm. were strong women as well, and there you go. had done yeah. a lot you know for them. My, my dad's mother was a single mother and raised two kids on her own, working mm. three jobs. Um, my other granny had worked from when she was a kid and kind of had loads of kids and just yeah. kind of had really, they just always worked. And I think that's, it was a real working thing. I started work when I was young. Yeah. I'd worked, you know, in, in hospitality and then in bars and whatever else and just had always worked because I always wanted to earn my own money. I was quite a social yeah. kid and wanted to be out all the time and my mum <laughs> stopped giving me pocket money and said, if you want to do it, you need to earn it. Good so that you. was kind of yeah. the space. But yeah, I think, I don't know. I don't know. Mm. I think for my daughter as well, I just want to set a, a standard of, yeah. You know, just just try. Yeah. And she'll pick that up by osmosis as well. Hopefully, yeah. Because, I mean, you yeah. can be scared. It's okay to be scared. Mm. Like, I'm petrified of a lot of things. You know, I suffer really badly with anxiety. Mm. I've, I've got, you know, I've been seeing a therapist through my work, which is fantastic. Yeah. It's a great thing to have. It just helps yeah. you explore all of those things that you want to kind of get out. Yeah. And they've said, you know, potentially I could have ADHD, which, again, is another journey for me. But actually, it makes a lot of sense when I look back on different things. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, that actually makes quite makes a bit sense. of sense. Um, but all of that is quite exciting for me because mm. it's kind of like, okay, well, that that's fine. What yeah. else can I do then? Yeah. And it's so, yeah, it just kind of makes me who I am. And I like the fact that I'm different to anybody else. There mm. isn't another version of me, mm. um, which is probably a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I, do, I, I like it and I just think, well, yeah, I can bring different things. Mm. And that's why it's great to have that real kind of 
mix of people and a mm. real kind of open demographic when you work places and, and that's what kind of makes our culture so good at the gym is that we are really driving that mm. because I think you can bring different viewpoints we've all had different experiences mm. and the way that you challenge things is usually be based on your own experiences yeah. and so you bring different uh, perspectives and yeah. I think that's a real healthy space yeah definitely what advice would you give to others maybe that are in a similar situation to your brother that are applying for opportunities but are not necessarily, they're not necessarily giving the same support that perhaps the gym group are offering? Because the thing is, there will be other people in a similar situation that are going through the same motions, but they are finding it difficult to position themselves for those opportunities. Mm. So what are your thoughts on that? What can they do to help themselves? Find an ally, I think, is probably mm. the biggest thing. So, I mean, not just people with Down syndrome, people with disabilities, anyone. people with any, yeah. any, you know, any yeah, kind anyone. of whatever their barrier might be is is find an ally. And that might be, like we said earlier, someone who's been on the journey before, someone who shares some of the similar interests, someone who works for a business that you want to get into and just ask questions and, yeah. you know, put yourself out there, say what it is you want to do and find out how you get there because you might not be ready made at that point there might mm. be things that you need to do there could be training there could be self-development that you could do mm. um you know there's lots of different ways to get there mm. you just need to create your own path and i think mm. just try not it's really difficult isn't it but you can't rely on other people to mm. do things for you you kind of have yeah. to forge your own path and that can be really difficult because mm. there are barriers for people mm. you know whether it's finances whether it's um entry level stuff that just doesn't work it could mm. just it could be many different things mm. um but you just have to kind of get creative, I guess, yeah. and find a way to do something. And if it's not exactly what you want to do, find a way that gets you there in yeah. a similar thread. You know, if it's like for me, I, I love working with people. It's my thing. And I think I was very social. That's why I liked working in bars and working in retail because mm. you were always talking to people. You were always able to help people. Yeah. And actually recruitment was an extension of that because yeah. I was getting to talk to people all the time and I was right. getting to help them find a job. I was making other people happy by finding them the right candidates. So you were kind of just doing a lot of, of that. And then mm. I kind of fell into recruitment. And I think you can get there mm. by trying different things. Yeah. I mean, I never, ever thought that I would end up in Tell recruitment. Position, yeah. Yeah. yeah, just never. I mean, I did media and American studies at university. Wow. I mean, it's got nothing to do with anything <laughs> that I different. do. Um, yeah. So yeah, you just just try different things and take risks sometimes. Put yourself yeah. out there yeah. and you will get knocked down. I mean... Yeah. You always will. It happens all of the time to everybody. But sometimes you just got to try and find a door, and yeah. even if it's just open a little bit, just kind of wedge your foot in there and get in, get, yeah. in, get in the conversations and have yeah. Do you know what I mean speak yeah. to the right people? Yeah. And that can be difficult, but you can just just keep trying. I think just yeah. try and stay as resilient as you possibly can, and finding an ally will be really useful. So you know, there's lots of different groups, there's lots of different mm. charities, there's lots of different places. Mm. And there's lots of people like you who want the same things. Mm. You know, you're never alone in those challenges whilst it feels really all consuming and mm. very individual to you. There's other, always a lot of people in the same space. Yeah. I think so you just, have to be proactive though uh, yeah. alongside that because I, I was just about to ask you, how do you find an ally, especially if you don't have the network around you? But like you've just said, it's those charities, it's those other organisations yeah. around you and that requires proactivity and, and taking that risk. And looking for programmes. Like there's, yeah. there's always different internships and you have to be willing sometimes to sacrifice a little bit yourself yeah. to get where you want to go. And, right. and sometimes it's not always taking steps forward. Sometimes mm. you've got to take two Step steps back. back to go forward again. Yeah. Um, you know, and that's that can be really difficult that can yeah. be really hard yeah. you know I left my job working in the in the agency when I went to work with my friend and mm. kind of needed to take a break from my own sanity I had a lot of stuff going on in my personal life mm. and I just needed a bit of space and recruitment just wasn't the one for me at that point in time right. I needed some headspace to be able to kind of concentrate on family and the things that I needed to do and so I took a step back I worked two part-time jobs one doing customer services and mm. one doing social media for people and but again, I went in to do social media and kind of was like, right, actually, I could train people because I kind of mm. know what I'm talking about mm. here. We could do this. We could create a course. And we sold it to young entrepreneurs who were starting up businesses and helped them set up their social media spaces and how to kind of target their audiences and, and all of that kind of stuff. So it was something totally new for me, but I knew a little bit about it and I knew enough to help other people. Mm. Um, and actually, yeah. So, I mean, I took 20 steps back from being a recruitment yeah. manager for a massive you know international yeah. brand yeah to doing two little part-time jobs in a, in the village that i lived in yeah 
to then be able to get the opportunity to come and work for the gym group. Yeah. So they were really good because sometimes that can be quite a nerve wracking thing for people when it's mm. on your CV, you've had a break that's got nothing to do with what you do as a yeah. career yeah. to then come back into a management position. Yeah. But yeah, they took a chance on me and hopefully it, paid it worked off. out. Yeah, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> it worked out. Hopefully we've done some really good things in the time that I've been yeah. there. So yeah, we it's it's been a great experience. Yeah, for sure. I want to shift your mindset onto the topic of diversity mm -hmm. and inclusion in the context of recruitment. And this is a topic that we're both passionate about yeah. and we've spoken about it as well and had some conversations about it. One thing that I've noticed, especially during my time in recruitment, is how many businesses really struggle to find diverse talent and to be inclusive. And still yeah. to this day, I, I work for a tech recruitment startup and even in my capacity as you know doing all the business development, I get a lot of clients coming up to me and saying, Shivani, I'm really struggling to fill these tech positions and and I'm really struggling to find women for these particular roles. And so how do we increase those businesses' chances of hiring the right talent that's inclusive and diverse? Because that's a problem still to this day. Yeah, but I think sometimes businesses have to take a lot of accountability for that. You have to create a culture where women, as an example, mm. feel comfortable. Right. So that can be looking at your policies that you've got. You know, mm. are you looking after, you know, if we're talking about women as a, as a particular sure. example, you know, have you got policies that actually support women through their entire life cycle? Mm. Because women, unlike men, come into a work and go through a life cycle. So they will come into work young, come in and fresh from university or fresh from another job and, and come in and want to make changes. And then they might choose to have a family. They might not. They might mm. continue doing on that path, but they might choose to have a family. So then they're going to go off on maternity. So what are you going to do when they come back? Have you got policies in place to support them to yeah. take maternity and actually enjoy that time? Have you got some policies in, in place to support them when they come back? Uh, you know, flexibility around having to take time out with childcare and sick kids happens all the time. Is there a level of flexibility there where it's not, you have to be in the office five days mm. a week and you have to, you know, you're, you have to be seen to be in the office staying mm. past five o'clock because mm. if you want to get ahead, then you, you know, it's that, it's shifting mm. that mindset because some businesses still unfortunately do have it. Yeah. And then obviously for past that point, you get into kind of perimenopause, menopause, you've got all of those things. Have you got policies that support them through that journey? Mm. Because actually that's a really tough space if you don't have it. Mm. Because also if you're fully male, you mm. might not understand it. But right. if you've got wives, they're going to go through that journey too. So actually, you're going to learn a lot from doing that. We are really lucky that our um, people director is very, very passionate about the menopause. I remember when she first joined, it's literally what all she spoke about from, <laughs> from uh, morning, noon and night. Um, but she's kind of really taken us on that journey and we're doing a lot of it. We've just done a, a female focused fitness program. Mm -hmm. We've done a lot of training we're doing. We've done kind of emerging talent to bring people through and we've focused on females for doing that to try and bring more and attract more females into the industry. Um, and I think you have to start there. You have mm -hmm. to create the culture and the space where a woman can thrive in that environment. Yeah. And I think I said to you, like, I don't ever want to be in a job because I'm female. That's not I was why just I want about it. to say that about the tick box exercise. Yeah, I don't, I I don't want gonna... that. I don't want to sit on a, on an, in an interview and come out of it thinking, God, I really stuffed that up. And then they ring yeah. off me the job and I'm really excited. Yeah. And then you walk in and you think, oh, everyone's male. I'm yeah. the only female here. Yeah. It's probably a reason why they pick, you know, I don't ever want to feel that. I want to feel like I earned my seat at the table. I bring something to the table and therefore, you know, I can I have the confidence to try things and, and yeah. feel in a safe space. But that's done through having that comfort of knowing that actually you're, you're in a space where it's built for you to thrive as well as everyone else, not at the expense of anybody else. That's not great either, is it? Like, I don't want to feel like I'm, I'm taking strides to the detriment of people around me, mm. whether they're females or males. That's mm. not ever where I want to be either. So I think it's really important to create a space where you are making it equal opportunities. Yeah. yeah. And it's not about, you know, there's a real great graphic on the internet, I'm sure if you look at it, where the people are spectating the football mm. and they're on boxes. Mm. And it's about moving the boxes around so everyone has an equal stance and not one higher than the other or one pushed more for you know pushed further forward than the others it's about giving everyone the equal space yeah um and yeah creating that level playing field for people yeah and people will naturally succeed in that space because you're encouraging them to do it so i think that's where you need to look and then from you know from other perspectives it's about mm. creating we said it before mm. to to be it you have to be able to see it so it's about being able to create those spaces and mm having people come in and talk about things that will be interesting to females mm. or put 
you know, benefit packages in that actually will support people with their families because they benefit men as well because men yeah. have families. Yeah. But they also benefit women and they make it a little bit easier. I remember applying for the job at the gym route because it said they were flexible and that you were able to work from home and they had core hours, but you didn't have to do a nine to five. You could take time out. So for me, I do the school run, do the school mm. run in the morning, I do the pickup in the afternoon and I work around it. Mm. So that was the biggest reason that I applied for the job because being a mother, I kind of yeah. was like, well, I have to, I have to deal with that. So, yeah, it's about creating that space where actually that's going to attract people and showing it in your marketing, mm -hmm. showing when you have your recruitment campaigns, show people the demographic that you want. It might not necessarily be truly reflective of where you are today, mm -hmm. but it can be what you strive to be. Mm -hmm. So show people that that's kind of, that you recognise actually mm -hmm. that that is what brings value. Yeah. Because if you put value in that, other people will feel confident enough to apply and will feel that their values are aligned to what it is that you're talking about and what it is that you stand for. And they're then more likely to apply. And I think there's also ways that you can do it. There's, again, keep talking about charities, but there are charities, there are groups, there are, you know, there is, I always see the thing about women in tech. There's always different yeah. situations that you can go to. There's, you know, there's webinars you can join. There's to educate network yourself. groups. Yeah, there's yeah. network groups. LinkedIn is, a, yeah. you know, is, is great for that. It's a massive space to be on there and to start conversation and have people contribute. Um, so, yeah, I think it's just about being seen to be doing those things will make people naturally take notice. You yeah. can't sit and say you're doing it and then bring people in and it's like, well, okay, this isn't what you sold me because they're not going to stay. You won't retain them if that's the case. Yeah. And there's absolutely zero point in attracting them if they're not going to stay because yeah. you've just cost yourself a load of money and you've got no further forward. So, yeah, just creating the environment where people can thrive, whether that's females, whether it's people with disabilities, whether it's people from, you know, who identify as LGBTQ+, right. creating a safe space for them to do whatever it is that they want to do, mm. then, yeah, that, then you're going to attract those people naturally. Yeah, yeah. And I think also the language that you use yeah. in those job specifications, yeah. in when you're, especially because that's what they're going to review at first glance when a candidate mm -hmm. is looking at a, an opportunity, that is what they're going to see. And yeah. if they see that language that's collaborative, that that really seems supportive, that's what I think attracts, especially for women. I think yeah, that sure. really, really helps. I mean, well. yeah, like I said, I saw in the advert that it was, it offered yeah, flexible working. Exactly. So for me, that was a tick box. You know, there are great, there's great websites that are specifically tailored to certain markets. For me, that probably doesn't work so much for us because, you know, I asked a few of my colleagues whether they would necessarily go and look at a website that was purely aimed at a certain demographic type. Right. And again, like I said, I don't want to be in a job because I'm a woman. So yeah. I'm kind of not necessarily going to gravitate to a site that has that on it, yeah. but it might work for some industries. I don't know. It's it's yeah. a real, you've got, sometimes you've just got to try yeah. it and find out and be yeah. willing to kind of test the water a little bit and see whether it works. But, you know, changing the, the language in your uh, job adverts and things like that, you, there's lots and lots of advice and there's lots of material on the internet that you could read up about it, about not, there's certain words you should try and avoid if you want to attract um, different demographics, whether that's a slightly older age group, whether it's more females, and you know, there's certain things that you need to be able to take out of your job descriptions right. because they just sound in a, a certain way. way. Yeah. Um, for us, we've added... Um, a disability element to it mm -hmm. so if someone isn't capable um, or has barriers to being able to fill out an online application because they might not be able to navigate a, a computer they might not have a computer <laughs> for whatever reason yeah, but yeah. they might not be able to do the online applications we have put it on the end uh, you know on the bottom of our adverts that we do encourage a wide demographic of people and if actually you struggle with filling out the online application there's an email there's a telephone number you can get in touch with us and we will t we will push you through that recruitment yeah. process we'll help you with it and we'll support so actually we've made it more accessible for people no. we fact we put it on there as, as a disability focus piece it came out of our disability focus group um but actually we found that it's helped a lot of people who just struggle with that yeah. element of it the tech part and whatever else yeah the fact that there's the option there is really really good for yeah. sure no definitely yeah. I want to talk a little bit about the tick box exercise because mm. you mentioned just now that you don't want to be hired just because you're a woman and we're going to get into that but a lot of businesses I feel treat diversity and inclusion like a tick box exercise they will have all the diversity quotas all the information shared online they'll talk about it they'll there's a lot of awareness now mm. compared to before and I yeah. think that's really good in terms of the ethnicity reports in terms of you know gender pay gap reports that type Massively, of thing yeah. which is brilliant but there's this concern that are these businesses actually taking action are they doing anything about yeah. it and again the fact that the gym group 
are running these initiatives are doing something about that doing something about it is really attractive how do we encourage businesses to take this more seriously and actually take action because it's still an ongoing problem there's still an ethnicity problem especially in leadership positions mm-hmm. i've i've yep. seen it across a number of different sectors what what are your thoughts on that i think again i'm not an expert so people may have m- many different thoughts on it but for us i think having giving people in the business mm. the voice mm. to say what they want and what they need and what the obstacles that they feel are in place has been really useful. So we set up uh, the focus groups. So as I said, I'm in the disability one, but we have one for age, we have one for gender, we have one for LGBTQ+. We have one for, and I'm going to forget them, which is really terrible. <laughs> um, oh, what is the other one? There's five. Um, <laughs> I'll have to think about it. We'll come back to it. Um, but they, you know, we, we've set up those groups with people who have a natural vested interest in those areas and making it a more accessible space for those people who identify in that, in that group. Yeah. Um, cultural diversity that's what it was there we yeah, go the, the <laughs> one. yeah uh, we have loads but yeah they're, they're really great and we've done some really great things we have these groups that really kind of focus on those areas what can we do what are we doing currently you know in the disability group i can speak from personal experience we reached out to uh, you know the royal national institute for the blind we re- reached out to uh, schools and different colleges for people who had hearing impairments and we had like lots of different things to get advice as to okay what could we do mm-hmm. how can we make ourselves more accessible mm-hmm. not just for members because for us it's a double double thing it's obviously how can we make ourselves more accessible for members but also for people to come and work for us and we asked questions and we allowed people to talk and voice what they felt was good and some some of it was just recognition really was just kind of recognize that I'm different and I have mm-hmm. a different mm-hmm. I bring something different I learn yeah. differently I have yeah. a different a perspective and allow me the space to feel safe enough mm. to have that conversation. So we kind of encouraged that and that was really good for us because that gave us the space to kind of make changes or at least suggest changes or bring different things to the to the discussion. Um, we had different forums, which were really great. That again, we mm. got to share things. So we started doing our podcasts nice. um, where we talk about different subjects that kind of get people to kind of have a say. And um, mm-hmm. we bring experts in from external uh, and they get to kind of share their experience as well and share kind of shed some light on things for people that yeah. we might not be aware, aware of. Um, we shared some videos. So again, we let our people do the talking for us. So yeah. we kind of reached out and got people within the business who kind of faced that age barrier, you know, so we're a slightly older worker and we allowed, we got them in and we did a video that featured them and their lives and what their journey had been. We did the same for gender, we did the same for cultural diversity, we did the same for disability, um, and they just told their story. Because mm-hmm. actually us telling you what it is mm. and why it's great to work for us because we're really diverse and mm. look at this, isn't this great? Mm. Yeah, that's great, and most businesses can do that. But mm. actually what we did is we allowed our people to tell why it was a great place to work mm. for them mm. because they identified in that demographic. Yeah. And that was a really great tool for us. It was a really great thing for me. It was, an, again, another one of my projects that I really did love. <laughs> um, but we've got, um, you know, a really great DNI lead in the business who is, like, challenging people to do more a- right. and bring more and think creatively and think mm. outside the box and just yeah. do stuff that's different. Yeah. Because everyone kind of, you know, our recruitment campaigns, it was the first thing I did was, like, right, we know we want to be diverse. We've got some really great diverse talent. We need to showcase that because actually it's all well and good hiring a load of actors to show everyone how diverse we are, but actually let's show our real people. Yeah. And so we did that in our recruitment campaigns and the Be You With Us campaign was very much about that. You can be you, mm. whoever you are, in our business and we'll support that. Mm. Um, and that went really far for us. We, we did a lot and actually, again, we mentioned Glassdoor, that mm. kind of our ratings on there for diversity and inclusion are the highest in our industry. Mm-hmm. So we've made some really great moves in that area. And I think it's just about, yeah, challenging yourself to make a difference and to impact someone or, or you know, a demographic mm-hmm. by doing something different and giving them that space. Yeah. So, yeah, to, to kind of take it to that next step is it's great to have conversations and having the conversation is the first place to start yeah. because we can sit and assume that we know. But I can't speak for all women. I can only give my experience. Yeah. So if you get a group of women to talk about their experiences and what it is that they're passionate about and what they feel they need from their work environment, you're going to get a lot of different perspectives. And that's great because then you can kind of find the ones that are the low hanging fruit that Mm. you can start to kind of tackle first. Mm. There might just be misconceptions Mm. or things that are in place that maybe just aren't conducive to a a kind of a female thriving environment. Um, 
and then yeah just learn from those things and be willing to make changes I think mm. don't ask the questions if you're not going to do something about it you don't yeah. have to have a massive budget no but you have to have the want and the desire to to do it you know we made we've made kind of our, we've set out our goals and where we want to get to for with regards to female um we want to be 50 50 so we want to have gender parity in our business yeah. by 2030 yeah um which is a is a big challenge because in our industry it's probably 70 30 we're mm. we are bucking the trend on that we are ahead of that which is great and we're getting towards the 50 50 we're mm. moving in the right direction mm. but um yeah we've kind of said that's where we're going to get to and we've been out we've been out and we've been loud about that on our you know in our socials on our when we actually did a um international women's day two years ago i think it was when we actually announced that mm. um so yeah we're, we're, and we're doing that across the board as a yeah. business like we want to be better we want to be the best space yeah. for people to kind of come and and not to beat your competitors because it's good to have competition it's healthy yeah but just to be different and to stand for what we stand for mm. um and i think that's a really good thing and that's what our competitors do too you've just got to find your niche haven't you mm. and kind of run with it yeah and that's the same for individuals i think you just yeah try your best i was just going to add that i think that second step that implementation stage is is really critical because mm. i know there are so many businesses that talk about it they have they they talk about race they talk about ethnicity they have these conversations and that is so powerful and so strong because you really hear the genuine views of people yeah. but then it's that step that next step of what we're going to do next and how long are we going to take and is it really going to be implemented in six months 12 months to a year whatever yeah. um and that's the thing that i I think is crucial and sometimes I feel that's missing with businesses and yeah that's that's my feeling about the tick box tick box exercise that um it's it, it feels like still a bit of an issue and but. I think that's why it's so important to have a really diverse group when you're having the conversation right. because you know if it's a room full of men telling you what you need for women it's probably how yeah, yeah how are you going to do that how are you going <laughs> to no. be in the right space and yeah. likewise for cultural diversity mm. if it's a group of all white people telling you what's great for cultural diversity, yeah. you're probably going to struggle a little bit. So actually open up the forum and make sure that you have the right people in the room to give their their experiences and their what they feel the obstacles might be because you might not have even thought about it. Mm. And that that's the most important part. Yeah. And then I think it's about, yeah, just pushing to deliver. And, and, and we talked about allyship earlier. Exactly, yeah. Be an ally for people whose voice maybe isn't being heard and yeah. kind of make sure that you're having the right conversations with the right people and you're driving that agenda and not just kind of ticking the box yeah. and saying, Oh yeah, look, we do it. We're really good at D and I well, how? What have you done? Yeah. Yeah. Where are you making changes? What are you doing that's different? Mm -hmm. Because that's the well, the only way we're gonna move forward is if we keep trying new things and try and open up the space. Yeah, for sure. I wanna to talk to you a little bit about balance because you know, we've we've talked about this as well, that there's a real balance that has to be achieved between hiring top talent and the person for the job that's skilled at doing a job. And that has to be balanced with, you know, being inclusive, being mm -hmm. diverse. How do businesses achieve the balance between the two? Because as you said, and, and I agree with it too, that I would, if I was going for an opportunity and an employee was considering me, I would hope and I'd like to think that they're considering me based on my skill set and ability to get, to get the job done. Yeah. If they're just hiring me purely based on the fact that I'm Indian and that I'm a woman, then of course that's a problem for me yeah. so how do we strike that balance between the two i think it's it's we, we do it kind of in lots of different ways so we don't work with agency hugely but when we do we we do kind of set out demands for a, a you know a diverse shortlist mm -hmm. i don't just want this the, the same old same old i need we need a device because mm -hmm. the only way we're going to drive it is if we force that mm -hmm. space yeah so yeah. we do ask for that when we work with any agencies but likewise you know putting things in place on the on the job adverts so changing the way that you word them so that actually they're more widely um attractive to people and they talk in the right kind of i don't mean language when i say it but they're yeah. using the right type of language yeah. to kind of attract the people that you want to attract yeah. and not just one straight demographic no yeah. i think you have to be able to talk about those things and open up that market space mm. and then making it a making it a, a level playing field for people so giving people the opportunity if they can't so as an example interviewing mm -hmm. um interviewing in a certain way and not giving out questions before so a lot of the time you won't tell people what you can ask them in an interview of course you wouldn't why would you do that because they're going to prep and they're going to rehearse yeah. all their answers but actually if you're trying to attract people who are neurodiverse mm -hmm. they will struggle mm -hmm. quite often in an interview situation because of the overwhelming anxiety of what's going to come and not being able to kind of 
understand what you're going to ask them and then feeling that they're going to make a mistake. And so actually people who are neurodiverse, if you can give them the questions prior, they just know what they're coming into and actually yeah. you're going to get a much better response. And why wouldn't you do that? Yeah. Because actually some people are just really good at interviews and then they're terrible in the job and some yeah. people are absolutely We've terrible. In, yeah, <laughs> Some people are terrible in interviews, but actually you get them in the right space in the right kind of frame of mind and make them feel comfortable. You can see what they can do. Yeah. So I think it's about being a much more open minded when you come at it and not being so regimented with mm. you must do this interview and we must do this on video. Mm. Because, again, we did a lot of video interviewing for um, the Kickstart programme because we had such massive volumes of people that we needed to get through. But not everyone was comfortable doing a video interview because actually that panic of having to record yourself and, and not having the response back from someone was really, really difficult for people. So some of them we had to do on the phone. Mm. Some of them mm. we had to do face to face. So yeah. we had an individual in one of our gyms who was hearing impaired. He couldn't do the video because he didn't feel comfortable doing it. He didn't want to do it on Teams because it was going to be a bit of a struggle. So we brought him in and we did it face to face. Mm. Um, and again, likewise, when we put him in the gym, we were just coming out of the pandemic. So we made mm. sure that we ha we bought um, clear face masks for everyone in the gym so that he still felt comfortable in that space. So it's about making those small changes for people and being adaptable and agile in the way that you do it. So yeah. recognising that people might not be able to access the website mm. correctly. So actually having it in different places is, is really useful. Um, your interview process, can you share the questions ahead of time? Is there flexibility on it? Don't just be like, oh, well, they didn't answer that question very well. If mm. you probe into it, give them the space and make them feel comfortable because actually... I mean, how many interviews have you done in your lifetime with people? And yeah, you're like, countless. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And then the first time you meet them, they're, they're never. And then the second time you're like, actually, yeah, they're warming up a bit. Yeah. So you know then what's getting them in the right space. Yeah. And it's just about that. It's about coming at it with a lot more of an open mind and not just expecting everyone yeah. to knock your socks off in the first yeah. five minutes because that's not always going to happen. You have to give people the benefit of the doubt sometimes. Yeah. And I also think those individuals will really value that. They'll yeah. really appreciate it and they will take that on board and they will go to the next interview process with the same mindset. And yeah. I think having that appreciation and, and care for those individuals yeah. is really important. That's why the constructive feedback yeah. is so important. Yeah. So even if it's a no, explain why? to them what they could have done better and what yeah. the differences were and what it was you were looking for that they maybe didn't have and actually if they went away and did this so we do it a lot with our internal applications and mm -hmm. we're trying to do it with the wider application yeah. pool but it's quite difficult because we do have a lot but you know if people apply for jobs internally and, and don't get them for whatever reason we will set them a lot of training goals so we'll introduce them to free courses that they mm. can take to help them in that specialism that they want to move into mm. and there's all of those things that we can do and we try and encourage them to do that self-development we'll help it with the experience but there's things that they can be doing mm. to get themselves so that the next time the role mm. comes up they're in a much better position and they kind of a lot more confident in their own abilities and you know they're not just winging it and hoping for the best yeah. but they, they've <laughs> actually got something there to back it up mm. so I think that's really important it's just mm. It's just listening to people mm. and understanding what it is that their drivers are and figuring mm. out whether that's what matches with you and, you know, making sure that the, the culture is the right space to foster that because, mm -hmm. you know, everyone says that they've got a great culture, but it's mm -hmm. really important that people are heard and they feel valued and respected and, mm -hmm. you know, recognised for the work that they do. Yeah. And that you're giving people the space to bring their ideas mm -hmm. to the table because yeah. otherwise if it's always the same voices that are telling you stuff you're only ever going to same up, end up with the same results so you kind yeah. of it's good to expand your horizons with the people that you speak yeah. to yeah listening to people is a big deal massive yeah. yeah this has been such an interesting conversation and um no I'm, I'm really glad i think listening is obviously really really important yeah. and it makes all the difference i have one final question for you okay. we're gonna we're gonna end things there but are there any future initiatives that you're looking to launch can you give us a bit of a snapshot of what may be happening in the future <laughs> so well uh we've Obviously, from all of the work that we did with Kickstart and all of the, the work that we've done with the inclusive traineeship, we are looking to run the inclusive traineeships again. Um, but I mentioned earlier that where that kind of came from was yeah. that movie. Um, and so we want to do it. That's why we called it inclusive traineeship, because we want to be able to do it for lots of different groups. So we want to try and do one that's age led and one that's gender led and one that's disability led and, and have lots of different areas where we can cover all of those groups and we're actually we're helping and giving that platform for people and the opportunity so we've got those coming up again which is really exciting and we're involved with all of the different groups about how we feel that we can bring that to life and best do it um, so that's coming for us and then I mentioned Karen earlier who's our early careers and she's worked miracles in our early careers um, department and she's kind of looking at bringing and replicating kind of what we did with the kickstart mm. um but working across again different demographics so not just necessarily that young 
um, unemployed, long-term unemployment kind of area, but looking at different areas where people might just want a career change mm. or they might be looking to do something else and and how we can do that. Because again, as a fitness industry, there is a real lack and shortage of people with the fitness qualifications mm. and you can't be a personal trainer without the qualifications. It wouldn't be safe, obviously. Of course. Um, yeah. So it's really important for us to bring people into that pool because we can't just sit on our hands and wait because the, the, the pool's getting smaller instead of bigger. So we need to kind of do something about it and Karen's really working hard to bring something into that so we've got a, a couple of things that are happening that we yeah. can't talk too much about because they're not quite out <laughs> there yet but um yeah that will see us bring an an opportunity for people to kind of come in and get the skills and get the qualifications and get into the fitness industry in spaces where they maybe wouldn't have had the opportunity before so again it's taking all the learnings that we have from kickstart multiplying them and doing it at, at volume and at pace and uh, yeah creating a space where people can tap into that love of fitness and make it a career and and that hopefully is what people will do because you you know it's you've got to have a passion for it you've got mm. to love working out because mm. i mean if you're going to train people you've got to kind of know what you're talking about so there has to be that underlying passion so it's just taking those people with that passion and giving them the space and the opportunity to get qualified and, and make a career and I think that's the great thing about doing it is that they don't just have to work for us for the rest of their life once you've got the qualification you're trained you can take that wherever you want to go and and do lots of different things with that qualification so yeah we, we've got some more programs up our sleeve that are going to come out and really kind of turn the current space on its head I guess and really drive through it so it'll be brilliant for the market for the industry and for us as a business it's going to be really good yeah i'm really excited to see what happens but yeah, this has been exciting. such a nice conversation honestly i've really really enjoyed thank it you. and That's thanks good. so much for coming on good yeah thank you for having me it's been lovely thank you <laughs>